The views and opinions of this broadcast do not reflect the views and opinions of Armed Media, UNU Productions and its affiliates. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Careers with Sarah on Armed Radio Global. I am here every Wednesday night at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. And I am sharing all kinds of tips and advice about careers. And I just started talking about how to become a great salesperson in your company last week. That's I have mentioned so many tips, so many advice that one hour wasn't enough to talk about this. So I have divided it into a second part, which I'm I'm going to be talking tonight. And I have so much great information that if you have a question and you are listening it live, you can actually reach out to me on Facebook at the Let's Talk Careers with Sarah. And you can also join my group, Let's Talk Careers Inner Circle. And if you are not listening to this as a recording, you are listening actually live, you can call me 1-800-508-5431. 1-800-508-5431. This line is going to be directed to me, to the show, only now at my, while I am on the show aired. So I'm looking forward for your questions. So let's start with um, habits that the salesperson has. So there are certain habits that um, you can identify with yourself if you feel that you have those habits that's That's wonderful. You're in a great path. But if you feel that you don't have those habits, then you have to hone them. So first, the salespeople usually identify and stick to their buyer personas. And they use a measurable, repeatable sales process. They know their products. They review their pipeline objectively. And they find shortcuts and hacks and they practice effectively uh, their message. They are active listening and they manage their emotions. They follow up. That's a big, big plus if you follow up. They personalize your message, their message. Uh, Take breaks, get eight plus hours of sleep every night. It's very important that you rest and believe in what they are selling. They identify their strongest motivator and they believe in what they are selling. They view the customer's success as their own. They build personal relationships and they prepare ahead of time. And they look for potential customers wherever they go. Now, the difference between good salespeople and great ones is staggering. Good reps hit their quota most of the time. Great reps don't just consistently hit, they have blowout months or quarters. Good reps earn their respect, trust, and prospects' trust and respect. And the great reps earn their prospects' admiration loyalty and referrals good reps can skillfully handle objections and great reps preemptively surface those concerns and make them disappear if you want greatness good news following those habits those 18 rules of good sellers will help you become one of the top selling salesperson on your team or even company okay so when I say that the salespeople set and stick to their ideal buyer persona I, I want to emphasize that 
a clearly defined buyer persona is crucial to an effective sales process. And a sales rep who sticks to that persona is effective in generating sales. Otherwise, a salesperson might fall back on a spray and pray tactics that result in inefficient prospecting. An effective rep researches the prospect to make sure they are a good fit. They stick to their ideal buyer persona and know exactly whom they are selling to and why. The next thing is when I say their sales process is measurable and repeatable, I mean that low performing reps let intuition guide them and high performing reps use a process that's optimized to move as many prospects as possible from connect to close. Low performing reps are always letting things slip through the cracks. High performing reps know the state of every deal in their pipeline what actions they will take next, and when. Low-performing reps never analyze their results because they haven't been tracking them. High-performing reps obsessively review their key metrics and adjust as necessary. To be extraordinary, you need a consistent process. The great salespeople know their product. Being able to sell is half the battle. Understanding what you are selling is the, is the other often underappreciated half. In the old days, selling relied on charm and snake oil tactics, but now that prospects have more access to information than ever before, they are not fooled so easily. To gain their trust and add a value to their lives, you have to truly know your product. Now. The next thing is they execute based, not feelings based, but fact based pipeline management. Effective sales reps don't mark a deal as likely to close because the influencer likes them. They are able to objectively review their opportunities, avoid happy ears, and come up with accurate sales forecast. They look for hacks. Once a great salesperson finds a strategy or a technique that works they use it again and again and again and again until it stops working this is smart reps are always working against the clock which means the more time they spend experimenting the less time they have for true selling plus there is an opportunity cost try one thing that doesn't work and you have missed the opportunity to use something that does i'm not suggesting you should never change up your approach just do so selectively and get results ASAP so you can either implement the tactic or move on. The next is they practice active listening. Successful salespeople are completely present when they talk to prospects. They are not thinking about another deal, scrolling through Reddit threads or sending funny memes to their team members. They are engaged and as a result their conversations with buyers are deeper and more meaningful. Active listening may be one of the hardest skills to develop since it's human nature to care more about what you have to say than your prospect. However, it's incredibly valuable. Not only will you build stronger relationships, but you will unlock information that will help you position your product as the best option. The great salespeople work extremely hard. It's 5 p.m. on the last day of the month or quarter. The B players have already left their office. They are at the bar nearby celebrating because they all made quotas. The C players are still in the office. They are sending off last-ditch email attempts to prospects they haven't engaged with in weeks. The A players are in the office too. They have already hit, but they are still sending emails, scheduling meetings, and making calls. And by laying the foundation for a great month before they need to, they always blow their goals out of the water. And they follow up. Many salespeople fail to effectively follow up after sending a proposal. They don't even know if the prospect opened their email. Um... There are ways that can help you with this issue. Letting salespeople know when and how often a prospect open up an email 
with this information they can follow up as an optimal time as far as i know there's a system called crm it's uh it stands for client relationship management and every salesperson uses it in any company that they work for and if the company doesn't have the crm then they are probably need to update their technology next the salespeople personalize their message instead of following a script and approaching each prospect with one size fits all mentality high performing salespeople are committed to learning as much as they can about a prospect to tailor their message these sales reps understand the unique pain points their prospects are facing and can explain why their product is a good fit I'll give you a scenario that happened to me this week. Um, I got a message on increasing my Instagram page following. So I read another message and it's copy and paste. I feel like it's the same script from a different person. It's copy and paste word for word for the first two sentences and then the last sentence was changed. Don't do this because imagine how many times you send messages to your clients, to your prospects, and then they get the same script because everybody uses the same script because they download it from the website or whatever. You should do it differently. You should really personalize it so they know that you are actually talking to them. It's not copy-paste just to get um, a deal. Um now the effective the effective um sales reps they stay balanced uh they experience more highs and lows in a single week than most professionals do in an entire month some days you feel invisible other days you wonder if you even belong in sales the successful reps have learned to manage their emotions and stay somewhere in the middle when things are going really well and almost all their deals are closing, they remind themselves not to get too cocky. When business dies down, they sell themselves not to become demoralized. They tell, they tell themselves, sales will pick up soon if they keep chugging. And salespeople take breaks. In sales, activity is often correlated with results. The more emails you send, the more meetings you book. The more meetings you book, the more demos you set. The more demos you set, the more deals you close. Following this line of thought, many salespeople end up working 10 hours, days, every weekday, and even putting in time on weekends. Not only is this bad for your mental and physical health, it's also unproductive. As Basecamp founder and CTO David Heinemeier, Hanson, points out in the fantastic piece of workaholism, some of the highest achieving people in history, like Kobe Bryant, LeBron James, Charles Dickens, and Charles Doran, prioritized sleep and balanced schedule. Breaks are scientifically proven to boost memory, focus, and quality of your ideas. If you are regularly burning the candle at both ends, you will eventually burn out. And plus, how much are you actually getting done between 6.30 and 8.30 at night? That time would be better spent reading, talking to your friends or family, watching TV or playing video games, cooking, walking your dog, basically anything that gives your brain a break. They get eight hours of sleep every night. The best salespeople out there. Think you can get away with five or six hours of sleep? Think again. According to the American Academy of Sleep Medicine, most adults need seven to eight hours of sleep per night. If you get less, you'll suffer from a laundry list of ailments, including irritability, decreased motivation, anxiety, symptoms of depression, Distrability, reduced energy, fatigue, restlessness, poor decision making, increased errors, forgetfulness. How many of us forget a lot because we don't sleep enough? To be at your best on sales calls, 
prioritize your sleep. Now, um, salespeople believe in what they are selling. It's easier to be passionate about and sell a product when you genuinely believe in it. The most effective salespeople actually use their product and believe in its value. If you feel meh about what you're selling, find happy testimonials from customers. Examples of how your product has improved people's lives in ways both large and small will reinforce your motivation and give you valuable social proof when you are meeting with prospects. Salespeople are strongly motivated. It doesn't matter what drives a salesperson, they simply need to be motivated. Every type salesperson has a burning reason for showing up to work every day and giving it their all. Maybe they want to buy a house and must make at least 110% of quota every month. Maybe they are super competitive and always want to be on the top of the leaderboard. Maybe they need to prove to themselves they can do well in sales. Ask yourself, what's my number one reason for wanting to be successful? If you can't immediately come up with an answer, you need to find that motivator. Salespeople view their customer success as their own. Salespeople don't stop working as soon as the prospect signs on the dotted line. Instead, top reps touch base frequently with their customers to seek feedback and provide tactical suggestions. For example, if you have already signed a contract, I'll give you an example that I've experienced. So I had a cleaning company. Maybe I've mentioned it previously in my show, maybe last week I mentioned it, but this is a great, great example right, right here that once you have a contract signed, you need to still follow up, get a feedback. Are you happy with the product? Are you happy with the service? I had a, a custodial company calling me. I signed a contract with them. They did the service, okay? This company was great, was excellent. They, if I had a complaint, you know, I knew to, to say it directly. And the company was following up with me via email. How are you satisfied with the cleaning? How are you satisfied with the service? Do you have effective communication with the cleaners? And I like that. They care. They have like um, a tremendous interest in my feedback. If I needed to reach out um, to the customer service line and explain to them a problem, they right away would address it. They right away would come and address the problem. They will not wait till the end of the day, their regular shift. They would just come and do whatever is asked to do. And on top of that, they will give you a survey in order, in order for me to see if I'm happy with them, if I would continue with them. Even though the contract is one year, if they still cared until, until, this custodial company had uh, moved out of the town and I had to look for a different custodial company. And assuming that every custodial company has the same, the same uh, motive, has the same kind of customer experience, I signed up with another one. And unfortunately, the other one, company B, I call it, the company B did not follow up with me. They had a contract, they signed, and I never, ever, ever heard from them until I had to constantly reach out to actually a supervisor of the custodial company. It's like I there, there's no customer service there. I had to reach out to the supervisor, and then the supervisor had to tell me that if I don't like it, I can just revoke the contract. There was no, it's not about meeting quotas of the month, but it's also making sure that the contract lasts, at least for many, for a long term, not like for a short term. So if you want to be the best salesperson, you just want to make sure that you follow up with your clients. You don't wait until they complain. You don't wait until they call you and tell you there is a problem. And okay, let's move on. Uh, the best salespeople constantly build personal relationships. Dan Tyre, one of the best salespeople I know, is a relationship builder. 
Tyre connects with people everywhere he goes, not in the surface level, LinkedIn way, or the let's exchange business cards way, in a but in a genuine way, human way, that makes you want to talk to him again. As a salesperson, relationships are your capital. You don't need down to April levels of charisma. On the contrary, a desire to help goes a lot farther than a magnetic personality. Salespeople prepare ahead of time. An effective salesperson prepares before a call. That means they do research on their prospect and gather all the information before a big customer meeting. Top reps don't wing it. They go in with a plan and a contingency plan. This way, they anticipate challenges or questions and prepare an effective response to avoid losing the sale. And the last thing is they're always selling. To overperform, you can't stop being a salesperson. As soon as you leave the office, successful reps are always looking for potential customers at parties, networking events, dinners, and so on. Of course, you have to read the room. Should you deliver a five-minute speech about the importance of life insurance at your cousin's jocks memorial? Definitely not. But if you are talking to your new friend Greta and she mentions she is in the market for life insurance, give her some handy pointers and let her know you'd be happy to talk more in depth. So this kind of information that you heard right now is really crucial and really important. To be a salesperson is a practice. It's an art. You have to just follow through with tips and learning more as much as you can. Even the best salespeople, they continue learning. They don't stop. I'll take a short break and I'll be right back. You are tuning in to Let's Talk Careers with Sarah. I'm aired every Wednesday at 10 p.m. Eastern Time. In this show, I talk about career advancement, resume revamps, interview expectations, how to stand out from the crowd, how to brand yourself, and skills you need to become a CEO. All of this is on Armed Radio on my show, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, exclusively on TuneIn Satellite and the Armed Radio Network. All right. So now, the next thing we'll talk about is signs your prospects are bulking and how to react. Even the best qualified prospects bulk sometimes, they might seem interested. But in reality, aren't as serious about closing as you are. It's important to understand why prospects bulk and recognize when they are doing it so you can either double down your efforts or walk away before wasting their time and yours. Why the bulk? Okay, here are some of the most common reasons. Prospects delay a decision to close. They don't see the difference. Prospects won't pick one salesperson, product or service over another if they don't see why one is better at doing something for them. Salespeople need to make it a priority to set themselves and their products apart from the competition. The timing is off. Prospects bulk when the sales doesn't when the sale doesn't fit into their schedule. A change in product or service may not be needed now, or they don't have the time to go through the process of buying. Every industry has a better times for prospecting and closing. They don't see the benefits. Prospects bulk when salespeople don't perfectly align their needs with the benefits of the product or service. They aren't comfortable. Prospects will hesitate if they don't feel comfortable with a relationship that has been established. That has to be rock solid built on trust, credibility, and honesty before they'll agree to close. The trust that a customer has in your company and in you strongly outweighs the techniques you use to sell. Says Mike Bugilla, Chief Product Officer at Kaseya. Establishing trust is better than any sales technique. Now, how they all bulk. Watch for these signs that prospects have lost interest or are changing their minds. They are Mia. After talking with you for some time, prospects don't answer calls, respond to emails, show up for meetings, or engage on social media. They waffle on their issues. 
they might suddenly say that the problem your product or service is supposed to alleviate isn't really the root issue. They're alone. Even when you are dealing with a person who has the authority to close the deal, there are other stakeholders. If they are never invited to meetings, the prospect is likely balking. They aren't prepared for you. Prospects who aren't prepared for you call for your call or presentation or is distracted with other tasks are unlikely to close. They repeat themselves. They ask the same questions because they are already convinced the solution won't work. So how to win them back? When you identify the prospects who are worth more effort, try these tactics to reinterest them in closing the sale. Start from now. Don't refer to past attempts to contract or to contact or engage with them. Train every effort as it's the first so they are more inclined to start anew. Ask for little closes. Give them reasons to say yes several times before you try to get them to say yes to closing. Ask them to read a white paper, meet for coffee, provide information and share a relevant link on social media. Easy wins. Find another contact. If a person, if a prospect goes dark, try to get in with another person at the organization by calling, sending an email, or connecting on LinkedIn. Vary your approach. We're all creatures of habit and often end up doing the same thing at the same time, in the same way. Call, email, visit at different times than you have tried. Who knows, maybe the problem was a bad timing. Getting a commitment. The best closers focus less on closing and more than op- on obtaining a commitment. Commitment change behaviors for the better. Prospects are more likely to do what they say they are going to do when salespeople do what they say they are going to do. A commitment on both ends. So be ready for but. Uh, to get and make commitments that are precursory to closing. The closer you get to asking for commitments and obtaining the close, the prospect will have more questions and but objection statements. I like it, but it sounds good, but but reveal genuine reason prospect reasons prospects aren't ready to close. So salespeople want to acknowledge those concerns before pressing on with a solution. The worst thing they can do is ignore or dismiss the statement. Either restate what you heard in a way that captures the essence of the concern or ask clarifying questions. Don't assume you know the exact meaning of the but. Reframe the issue or deal with misconceptions. And get a commitment. Once you're on the same page, you can ask for a commitment. Then you can use closing questions. Now is the time to get comfortable asking closing questions. The higher your level of comfort, the less likely you will appear too pushy or aggressive, which makes prospects comfortable. Commitment questions should seem like a reasonable request from customer's perspective and not just your perspective. There shouldn't be any anxiety, just comfortable questions that lead from one step to the next. One of the easiest ways to be comfortable with your closing questions is to use the sensory trial close. You create closing questions that use the word, the words who, what, where, why, how much, and when in combination with sensory words like look, think, touch, sound, feel, and view. When you ask questions in this format, prospects are usually comfortable answering. And for examples, how does that sound? Does this logic seem sound? Does that seem like a reasonable way to look at it? I feel like we have accomplished everything we agreed to. So how would you suggest we move forward? How do you feel about what we've discussed today? These are just examples. There can be anything that is similar to that. Then you can test the commitment. You will increase your closing ratios dramatically 
if you test the seriousness of prospect's commitment. So here are the four tips uh, to do that. Stay focused on the next step. To move prospects or customers forward, one action, not the entire closing. State that objective, perhaps reviewing specs, completing financing, or engaging IT, and ask questions to prospects so the prospects can see can see it as logical next part of the discussion. Listen to their responses and clarify what happens next. Then you can finalize the commitment. Once customers have verbally committed, you want to create clarity about what you will do now to further the sales process and finish the close. So use the closing or commitment questions that get at a specific action the prospect is likely to agree to take because it makes sense considering what you have discussed and agreed to happen. For instance, you can say, I'll have the final specs to you this afternoon. Can we meet tomorrow morning at 10 or 11 to sign and get production rolling? Or you can say, I can get the first order delivered to your door on Friday if we can arrange financing tomorrow. What terms do you want me to establish? There is incredible power in commitments. Most prospects who make a serious commitment will keep it, but you have to establish a hard commitment. Then you can close the sale. There is no perfect formula or phrase for closing sales. For, most, for the most part, closing is situational. Sales professionals need to ask for sale based on the relationship they have established, the circumstances they face, and the situation, situation they're in. Bottom line, salespeople need to read the situation and ask accordingly. 25 ways to ask. While there are as many ways to close the sale as there are circumstances surrounding it, so here are 25 phrases to use to ask for the close. Number one, it seems like this is a good fit for your company. What do you think? Uh, if we throw in a specific freebie, would that convince you to sign the contract today? Or uh, taking all of your requirements and desires into consideration, I think these two products will work best for you. Would you like to go with X or Y? The number four could be, why don't you give it or give us a try? <sighs> number five is, um, is there any reason if we gave you the product at this price, what you wouldn't do business with our company? Um, if we could find a way to deal with, um, let's say, their objection, would you sign the contract this week? The whole thing comes to only X dollar. Is that fair enough? Should I put that on a rush order, or do you prefer our normal four-day delivery? Should I book the time to kick this off? That's number nine. Number ten. Is it better to get this started immediately or wait for X to happen? Is there anything that prevents us from moving forward? That's number eleven. I hear it a lot from good salespeople. Is there anything that prevents us from moving forward? I can schedule two days next week to make the start, which are best for you. That's a closer. It always works. Can we proceed? You had mentioned earlier that if everything looked right to you, our next step would be X. So first, does everything look right to you? That's number 14. Number 15. Moving forward, will I work primarily with you as my main contact? That's very important to know. Number 16, are you ready to partner with us on this? Number 17, if you sign the contract today, I can guarantee we can fulfill a special request the prospect asked for. And how does that sound? Then number 18, will you commit to doing business with us today? Number 19, ready to move forward. Can I pull up the contract right now? You are interested in X and Y features, right? If we get started today, you will be up and running by Tuesday. That's number 20. Number 21. Unless you have any more questions or concerns, I think we're ready to get started. 
Number 22, we can take as long as you would like, but I know our scheduled time is just about up. With that in mind, maybe we should move to the actual agreement. Number 23, when should we get started on implementation? Number 24, what delivery date would you like? And the last one, number 25, which blank, right? It could be package, tier, bundle, do you want to go with? All of these examples are going to be on Facebook, on my page, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah. Um, if you would like to download them in a PDF, um, you can just uh, click on the link on my Facebook page and you can download them at your leisure. The next one is analyze the close or the fail. When the hard work of oneself or disappointment of a fail is over, the learning just begins. For salespeople, it's critical to analyze closes that are won and near closes that were lost. It helps you close the next sale. So understand the win. Researching wins as well as losses ensures that you receive a balanced perspective so you can continue successful practices and eliminate those that, that lose sales. Even better, okay. customers are more forthcoming with salespeople they've chosen to do business with. So here are the five reasons. It helps them justify to themselves that they have made the right choice. By explaining to you all the reasons they chose you, they are validating their decision-making process. It helps in transition from the sales process to customer service. Customers feel a sense of buyer's remorse if there is a drop-off as they transition into service. The relationship they developed with you and the feedback you request helps maintain their satisfaction. They are more apt to like you personally. The prospect likely clicked with you, which makes them forthcoming with both positive and negative feedback. They are more invested in the relationship. They have developed a sense of allegiance and a vested interest in your company, so the feedback they give you may help them in the future. They are more apt to share negative information since they have already given you the business and aren't as concerned with hurting your feelings. So let's take a break and I will return back with you with more tips. Stay tuned. Found a place to celebrate? But wait, you are missing a sweet table. With fancy desserts and a menu full of items of your choice. Call 347-265. Five zero six three. You can have a sweet table as if you are a celebrity. Quality worth every penny. Order from New York Artisan Bakery. Want to win your party? Call three four seven two six five five zero six three. So I am back and I'm going to uh, explain more about how to be a great salesperson in your company. This is part two. So here is we're going to understand why you failed to close. Okay, closing often fails for these seven reasons. Okay, salespeople didn't have all the skills and traits required to win. They need to be better researchers and leaders than ever. Winning sales requires knowledge, planning, and precise execution. Successful salespeople offer greater and more meaningful guidance and anticipate their competitors' next move. And salespeople don't understand their prospects' businesses. They don't do their homework. They don't think that everything is important. They don't have a plan to win. Almost half of the salespeople miss closing goals because they are too subjective about their forecasting. They CSO insights, sales operation optimization study. Many people just don't set the right objectives and goals. 
the salespeople don't know who their competition is. They get outsold because they don't know anything about the salespeople who are competing for the same business. You need to know their names, how they sell, whether they are new at the job or highly experienced or what the person is likely to do to win the business. Salespeople are afraid to get out of their comfort zone and assume a position of strength. Getting out of that zone allows you to be more persistent, to negotiate, to access to the real buyers, or to be more persuasive. Few comfortable places exist anymore for salespeople who don't have the courage to figure out what they need to win and take appropriate action. Salespeople depend on the capabilities of their product or service to close the deal. Not many companies have a unique enough product or service to simply blow the competition away. Winners differentiate their product or service in ways that convey value to customers. Great salespeople, they do their homework. You know, you're listening to my show, I'm guaranteeing that you are going to be a great salesperson. Because if you take notes, get post-closing for post or post-fail feedback in the format that each customer is most comfortable giving it. Email, online, written survey, phone call, in person, include this or similar questions. Uh, For example, in the end, what were the three most important decision-making criteria you used to differentiate competitors? Um, How did my firm compare to the competition in each criterion? Much better, slightly better, equal, slightly worse, much worse. Um, How was the final decision made? Who were the key decision makers during sales process? When you look back on our company's products and services, what are our strong points and where could we improve? When you look back on the sales process, proposal and sales presentations, what are my or our strong points? When you look back on the sales process proposal and sales presentation, where could we improve? Compare with the other firm's presentations, presentation teams, what did our team do well? Did the other competitors present anything that's not currently offered by our company? When do you think you will review? You will review this decision or your product and service needs again. Sometimes I know it's very hard to ask for feedback because you are afraid that the customer is going to complain to you or is going to say that your product is the worst nightmare that they had or your service is really lousy service. So by being a little bit upset over this, it's not worth it. Having feedback or anything like that. If you know a uh, Grant Cardone, he is a sales guru, and he says, if there is a client or a customer that has a complaint, he wants to personally deal with this. He doesn't want to have anybody else deal with this because he doesn't want to lose a client and because he doesn't want to he wants to know what to improve that's his feedback he doesn't take it very hard very personally to himself no he he gets a feedback a criticism in order to improve his business to improve his sales so let's go over the eight universal truth to closing regardless of industry product prospects listen to what's important to them Prospects pay attention to someone who they believe has something important to say to them. Today's prospects look to buy more than a product or service. Being viewed as an industry expert or advisor gives salespeople greater receptivity, wider and freer access to decision makers at higher levels and a stronger series of sales opportunities. Prospects buy when they are ready to buy, not when they need to sell. It's important to be in front of qualified prospects when they are ready to buy, not when you need to make a sale. When the wh- when and whether prospects will decide to buy anything has more to do with your schedule than the schedule of any salesperson. The key is to have a sufficient supply of qualified prospects and then be the one who is there when they are ready to make a buying decision. Closing is more about listening 
than selling. Listen prospects into buying instead of talking your way out of the sale. Closing isn't only about telling, presenting, and verbalizing. It's about asking questions, recording the answers, accurately listening, and allowing prospects to tell you exactly what, how, when, why, and under what conditions they will buy. All prices are too high, but you can't put a price on value. To prospects, any price is too high until they understand the value of the product or service. To deliver value, salespeople have first to understand what the prospect perceives as value. If salespeople prematurely quote price, they will never have a chance to create value and close the sale. Needs and benefits must be aligned. Presentations need to be tailored to prospects' needs and wants, not the salesperson's. This requires the capacity to understand how a prospect wants to see your product or service and present it in exactly that way. It requires total mastery of product knowledge, extensive pre-call planning and questioning, and a presentation that can be tailored, customized, altered, modified, or totally overhauled instantly to reflect prospect's needs. Reputation makes all the difference. The jump from character, what you are, to reputation, what people think you are, is much smaller than some salespeople believe. Good salespeople know what is that is tight, crowded markets. Their solid reputation is a powerful tool. It will help them prospect, market, and close better. A poor reputation can be devastating. Salespeople must believe first. Customers will never believe in the value of your product or service any more strongly than you do. Closing is all about believing that your product or service is true value that delivers the promised result. It's critical for salespeople to believe that the product or service they will sell is exactly what they say it is and will perform exactly the way they will say it will. And the last is trust. Sales and relationships are built on truth. Salespeople can't make claims, they can back up with facts. Prospects expect salespeople to make claims for their product or service. They are more impressed when salespeople provide testimonials and research to corro- corroborate their claims. Top closers work hard to get other sources to verify that the things they say about their products or service services are true. I will end hear about how you can close the sale and how you can become the best salesperson in your company. I hope that these two parts from last week and this week, which is today, you are taking notes and you're doing your homework because these tactics are very proven to work. And if you follow step-by-step techniques and tips you will end up being the most successful salesperson in your company. And you might even train others to become as good as you are. So I'm going to ask you, if you have any questions regarding sales, any questions regarding your career, any questions regarding your goals, send me a message on Facebook, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah. And join my group on Facebook, Let's Talk Careers Inner Circle. And if you don't have social media, I understand. I got you covered. Email me, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah at gmail.com. Okay, we are back. Um, I found a video on YouTube of Brian Tracy. He is the best salesperson. And he gives some tips and advice about how to become a highly paid salesperson. So here you go. Hello. When I started my sales career, a senior sales guy, and I still remember his name was Pete. He said, by the way, did you know that the top 20% of salespeople earn 80% of the money? And I said, no, I never heard that. He said, yes, it's called the Pareto Principle, the 80-20 rule. And I said, well, if that's the case, then I want to be in the top 20%. That simple decision, and I still remember the time, the place, the street where we were walking many years ago, changed my life.
Because what I learned was this, is that if you don't make a decision to be in the top 20%, you automatically fall by default into the bottom 80%. Nobody ever says, when I grow up, I'm going to be in the bottom 80% and struggle and worry about money all my life. But by failing to make a decision to excel, you unconsciously make a decision to be mediocre. So your goal should be to become one of the highest paid salespeople in your profession and accelerate your sales career by using the vital keys to success in sales, the vital keys to getting into the top 20%. And fortunately, this is easier than you might think. Now, number one, top salespeople do what they love to do. All truly successful, highly paid salespeople love their sales career. You must learn to love your work and then commit yourself to becoming excellent in your field. Invest whatever amount of time is necessary to improve your sales career. Pay any price. Go any distance. Make any sacrifice to become the very best at what you do. Resolve to join the top 10% and never stop until you get there. Now, here's something that changed my life. is when I learned that everybody who's in the top 10 or 20% started in the bottom 10 or 20 percent. And what hundreds of thousands and millions of other people have done, going from the bottom to the top, you can do as well if you decide to. Now, number two, top salespeople decide exactly what they want. Don't be wishy-washy. Decide exactly what it is you want in life. Set it as a goal for your sales career and then determine what price you're going to have to pay to get it. And let your mind float freely. Think about earning twice as much, driving a beautiful car, living in a beautiful neighborhood. It's all possible for you. Now, according to the research, only about 3% of adults have written goals. And these are the most successful and highest paid people in every field, including sales. These are the movers and the shakers, the creators and innovators. They're the top salespeople and entrepreneurs. And you can join them as well by writing down your goals in the first place. Now, number three, top salespeople back their sales career goals with perseverance and determination. A key to success in sales is to back your goals with indomitable willpower. Decide to throw your whole heart and soul into your success and into achieving your sales career goals, no matter how many obstacles or setbacks you experience. Make a complete commitment to improve your sales career and become one of the most highly paid salespeople in your field. Resolve that nothing will stop you or discourage you, no matter what happens. Now, number four, top salespeople commit themselves to lifelong learning. This, by the way, changed my life so dramatically when I was 24, almost like I tripped over something and picked myself up, and it was a great treasure. The treasure was that your mind is your most precious asset, and the quality of your thinking determines the quality of your sales career. If you commit yourself to lifelong learning... You will achieve such extraordinary success, and I cannot emphasize this too often. Read, listen to audio programs, attend seminars, and never forget that the most valuable asset you will ever have is your mind. As you continue to learn, you'll eventually become one of the most valuable salespeople in your company. The more knowledge you acquire that can be applied to practical purposes, the greater will be your rewards and the more you will be paid. Number five, top salespeople use their time well. Your time is all you have to sell. It's your primary asset. How you use your time determines your standard of living. So resolve, therefore, to use your time well every minute of every day. Begin every day with a list of everything you have to do. The best time you make up your work list is the night before prior to wrapping up for the day. Write down everything that you have to do the next day, starting with your fixed appointments and then moving on to everything else you can think of. Number six, top salespeople follow the leaders. Do what successful people do. Follow the leaders, not the followers. Not the people who are hanging out, going for coffee, going for drinks at 4.30 in the afternoon, going shopping during the daytime. Stay away from these people. Do what the top salespeople in your company do. Imitate the ones that are going somewhere with their lives. 
identify the very best salespeople in your field and in your office and then pattern yourself after them. If you want to become one of the best salespeople in your company, go to the top earners and ask them for advice. Ask them what you should do to improve your sales career. Inquire about their attitudes and philosophies and their approaches to their work and their customers. And here's the most remarkable thing. Successful people will help you. They will tell you things. They will give you ideas that can save you years of hard work. But you have to ask. Now, top salespeople, number seven, know that character is everything. Guard your integrity as a sacred thing. As Ralph Waldo Emerson said, nothing is more important to the quality of your life in our society. In business and sales success, you must have credibility. You can only be successful if people trust you and believe in you. So in study after study, the element of trust has been identified as the most important distinguishing factor between one salesperson and another and between one company and another. Now, number eight, top salespeople use their inborn creativity. So think of yourself as a highly intelligent person. Think of yourself as a highly creative person, even a genius. Recognize that you have great reserves of creativity that you have never used. So say aloud over and over again, I'm a genius. I'm a genius. I'm a genius. Now, this may sound like an exaggeration at the beginning, but it's not. The fact is that every person, including yourself, has the ability to perform at genius levels in one or more areas. You have within you right now the ability to do more and be more than you ever have before. All you have to do is have the confidence to try. And number nine quality of top salespeople is they practice the golden rule. You should also practice the golden rule in all your interactions with other people. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Think about yourself as a customer. How would you like to be treated if you were your own customer? Well, obviously, you would want salespeople to be straightforward with you. You would want them to take the time to thoroughly understand your problem or need and then show you step by step how his or her solution could help you to improve your life or work in a cost-effective way. If this is what you would want from a salesperson selling to you, then be sure to give this to every customer you talk to. And number 10, quality of top salespeople, they pay the price of success in advance. Remember, perhaps more important than anything else, resolve to work hard. This is a great key to success in life in any field. The key to success in selling is for you to start a little earlier, to work a little harder, and stay a little later. Do the little things that average people are always trying to avoid doing. When you begin your work day, resolve to work all the time you work. Don't waste time. Get going. Move fast. Now, what I've given you is sort of like a mental fitness plan. It's a sales mental fitness plan. Just as if you want to become physically fit, you work out with a series of different pieces of equipment. If you want to become financially fit as a salesperson, work out with these 10 ideas. And I promise you, as soon as you begin using them, you're going to see improvements faster and more effectively than you could possibly imagine today. All right, this was Brian Tracy on YouTube. I found him about um, how to high, highly paid salespeople are getting by in their, com in their company. Uh, let me know on Facebook, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah, and, um, or email me, Let's Talk Careers with Sarah at gmail.com about any topic that you would like me to discuss in my next show. I'm looking forward for your for your uh, input